Hey, thank you for uh, coming to our uh, Zoom uh, reading today. Um, we're featuring two members of the Poets Club of Chicago, uh, Pamela Miller and uh, Donna Pucciani. And um, Wayne Allen Jones is the current president of the Poets Club of Chicago. So Wayne, why don't you just tell everybody uh, just briefly wh what that what that is? Well, I'm just looking at the uh, forward to our, our most recent anthology, which came out in 2014. The oldest continuously running group of its kind in Chicago. Uh, it started in 1936. We've been nominated for and had many literary prizes from the Pushcart to the Pulitzer and have received fellowships from the Illinois Arts Council, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. So uh, it has a, a, a storied history. Um, we have at the moment, um, what is it? Uh, 12 active members. 12, 12 yeah. active members. And uh, the uh, Jared recently joined us to make the 12th. So. And a pleasure. Yeah, joined us back. I mean, we. I, yes, I, I, I was I was with the Chicago Poets Club in Chicago for I don't know a decade, something like that. Primarily, what we do is we meet once a month for a two plus hour uh, <coughs> round of critiques, where uh, we bring uh, poems in that we would like to have uh, responses from the other members. And uh, some other member reads them, and everybody talks about it, and it seems to work really well. We uh, we find it very useful and helpful. So we thought that since uh, uh, we're not able to get out into the uh, the world these days, that um, we wanted to connect with uh, other Chicago poets and other poets around the uh, the country, and so we're starting to feature uh, two. Uh, members of the uh, Poets Club of Chicago each month. And uh, this is our inaugural uh, reading um, with uh, Pamela Miller and Donna uh, Pucciani. And let me uh, just tell you a little bit about both of them. Uh, Pamela Miller has published four books of poetry, including Recipe for Disaster and Miss Unthinkable, both from May Apple Press. Her work has appeared in Blazevox, Rhino, Nix's Mate Review, Blue Fifth Review, May Day, Third Wednesday, New Poetry from the Midwest, Circe's Lament, Anthology of Wild Women Poetry and many other journals and anthologies. She's recently completed her fifth collection and is working on a visual poetry chapbook. And Donna has been published worldwide in such journals as She Chow Poetry, Poetry Salzburg, Voice and Versa, uh, Mediterranean Poetry, Paris Lit Up, A Cuman, Bela Festa, and Journal of Italian Translation. A longtime member of the Poets Club of Chicago. She served as vice president for over a decade. And she's the author of several books of poetry, most recently Edges, from which she'll be reading today. And Pam and Donna have decided to do a round robin reading. So um, each is gonna read for a few minutes and then the other will read and then back to the, uh, the first. And uh, so let me turn over the reading to uh, Pam and Donna, if everybody would please <laughs> mute yourself uh, so that there aren't any noises that interrupt the reading, that'd be great. And then after they're finished, we'll be able to have some discussion, question and answer, uh, and uh, just stick around to, to chat about things in general or things poetry specific if you, uh, if you like. So um, welcome uh, everyone, and I hope that you enjoy uh, Pam and uh, Donna. Uh, take it away. Okay, so um, I'm going to go first, and um, I'm going to start out with a, uh, well, first of all, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, I'm going to start start out with a, re what? Hello? <laughs> okay, I'm going to start uh, with, a, with a really silly poem. Uh, because I figure we can all use a, a few moments of levity in these grim times. So this is called The Spaghetti Squash Comes to Visit. We weren't ready for the squash when it knocked on the door with its head. 
the folks from the visiting produce program had told us to expect it on Thursday, but our oblong yellow guest was four days early. We hadn't had time to study up on spaghetti squash behavior. We assumed a vegetable visitor would be fairly sedentary, but it kept hopping around like an electric flea. It rocked back and forth on its legless butt. When we offered it a glass of water, it made a strange trombone-like sound. Plus, the gosh darn gourd only spoke French. La vie végétale, c'est une chose horrible. It sighed in its stringy, seed-filled voice. Mom thumbed frantically through her tattered old petit la russe, but the pages fell out in chunks. The evening dragged on like the digits of pie. 11 o'clock and still the squash wouldn't leave. It was watching TV, reclining on its side like some swollen, jaundiced football. We sat huddled together in pajamas of dread. Why had we agreed to host this thing? Who were we trying to impress? When the Schusters adopted a family of grapes, we didn't even send them a card. We couldn't kick it out, that would be rude. We couldn't cook it, we'd go to jail. We lay rigid and wild-eyed in our beds all night, the squash singing howlingly till dawn. Um, Oh, come on. <laughs> Stop the Mark Smith stuff. Um, <clears throat> this next one is called uh, trompe l'oeil, which in French means uh, an optical illusion. Uh, literally, it means fool the eye. I am not what I appear to be. Does my blouse hide four red electric breasts I could switch on one by one. There's not an inch of me you can trust. My molecules were bred to deceive you. I'm a mannequin rolled in a carpet of lies. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice disguised in tangled anthems. I am not what I appear to be. Take a guess at what I'm made of. Scrape off my face and you'll find what? If you unzip my skin, will I crystallize? There's not an inch of me you can trust. Affix your eye to my psyche's secret keyhole. Are those spangles you see or are they spikes? Like a coaxing doorway painted on a brick wall, I am not what I appear to be. You think you've sussed me out, but are you sure? My legs collapse in prayer, but my arms are filaments of mischief. There's not an inch of me you can trust. I am not what I appear to be. There's not an inch of me you can trust. Just when you're convinced I'm the algebra of anguish, my heart pops open like a bottle of spooked champagne and joy shoots out everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, these, the problem I always have with Zoom is that these earbuds don't want to stay in my ears. Okay, um, I don't, what? Oh, somebody's squeaking. Maybe it's me. Maybe I've got an echo. Oh, well. Um, I don't write 
a lot of personal poems or poems about real life, but um, this one is an exception. This is a poem about my husband's dysfunctional family. Uh, this is kind of my version of the Mary Trump tell-all book, except my in-laws aren't that bad. My husband, the science fiction writer, tells me about his childhood for Richard. I grew up face down in Chicago's spongy suburbs. We ate dinner every night at the Hippo Beef and bought clothes at the house of sad plaid. We vacationed down turnpikes, bland as envelopes, mailing ourselves off to some dank lake. My mother switched on her minuscule TV and watched nothing, nothing, nothing for 60 years. My dad was so cheap, he signed his name in blood, too skinflint to invest in a pen. My behemoth of a brother managed my allowance, snapping nickels in half and giving me neither. So I hunkered in the attic like Quasimodo, my defiant hair down to my knees, reading famous monsters of Filmland magazine and the tinfoil hat review, waiting for my rocket legs to sprout and blast me into breathable air, for my mind to stretch wide as a hovering spaceship, beaming me up to myself. Thanks very much. And now over to Donna. Um, today I will be reading a handful of poems to do a virtual tour. Oops, something's squeaking. I hope it's not me. Okay. That will give you a virtual tour of a few foreign countries where I have family and friends. So given that the pandemic has precluded transatlantic travel, I hope you will take this virtual tour with me. I will start with a poem set in Spain. A few years ago, my niece, a travel writer based in Madrid, wave Lori, <laughs> escorted me on a trip down south uh, to Granada where we drank wine together and watched the flamenco dancers perform in the caves outside the city. This is called Flamenco. The best dancers are not the slender young women with lipstick and scarlet ruffles nor the young men who fancy themselves latent toreadors stamping faster and harder than rain on a cave roof. The best dancers are the leather-faced old women, black shawled with castanets and fans, strong as bulls, barrel chested, big breasted, with heavy legs, fleshy arms, and coal penciled eyes dark as dying planets. Their grandchildren have picked our pockets on the buses near the Alhambra, and now we pay to see them dance in the caves of Granada. They put their skirts behind them to show clicking heels, calves marbled with ropey veins. The tourists are herded after the show into a night of cobbled streets and whitewashed hotels leaving the gypsies with hands burning from synchronized clapping, their ancient guitars silent. They drive home to paint-peeled caravans in the field beyond the mountain. Before sleep, the grandmother sifts her henna hair from tortoise-shell combs, spreads it out on the pillowed moon. But first, she counts the coins she earned tonight. Her feet have turned to rock. She never dreams. Next, I will be reading a poem called Beach Stone. And the stone I'm writing about. Oh, wow. And it's from a beach in Italy. 
And uh, I wrote it when I was visiting my newly discovered cousins, Pasquale and Carmen, um, who live up north in Bergamo, but who drove us down the whole length of the boot of Italy to a little town called San Donato, which is on the buckle of the boot of Italy, where Pasquale was born and also where my grandparents were born in the late 1800s. So we stopped at this beach, Beachstone, Calabria, Italy. Salvaged from sand, breath of gods, green edged petrified fizz of Tyrrhenian ebb and flow warm to the touch, sand encrusted stone cool on the cheek where fingers thumbed it smooth, a slow massage of the moon's hands in tides talking among themselves. I hear tales of old women in black with their hair tied up in rags, old men sitting in the square or herding goats where olive trees burn. Stone on a bookshelf below kindred skyscrapers, part marble, part volcanic ash, part legend, the sanctuary of memory through a miniature door of night the small-mouthed, foam-lipped, planet-dipped essence of itself, an opaque mirror, the rock on which my great-great-grandfather built his house up the mountain. He lived on land <coughs> cloud. He saw from his window this beach, this sea, this stone echo of a star. The next poem is um, reading Emily Dickinson in Italian. And it was written in Bergamo, which is up in the north of Italy, a night or two before my cousins took us on our journey south. And I was browsing in a local bookstore and discovered to my delight, many old friends translated into Italian, including the terse words of Emily um, sounding very strange in the multi-syllabic and very mellifluous Italian language. <laughs> Reading Emily Dickinson in Italian. I'm nobody at a bookstore in Bergamo, an abundance of vowels and silences. Up the narrow stairs lie the poems side by side, bilingual lovers curled quiet and sweet between the sheets like strangers for whom intimacy holds great promise. The books sidle each other in the dust of sun-washed air. I read the titles, Old Friends, La Terra Desolata, The Wasteland, Apologia di Spoon River, and Dickinson, Simply Poesia. Is this idolatry, my worship of work? <coughs> merely the love of sacramentals, the unlit candles of syllables crossed at the throat, verses and brilliant litanies pray on the altar of the soul, shivering beeswax. Ogni vita converge verso un centro. Each life converges to some center. September, a month of heat and joy. Cousin Pasquale sings to himself in the next room. His wife, Carmen, lays the kitchen table with white plates. Exultation is the going. Day after tomorrow, we set off for San Donato. My river runs to thee, the village of our grandfathers, a house with my name etched on a hill, my life before me. Emily's book falls open. Io abito la possibilità. I, I dwell in possibility. The next poem also takes place in a bookstore. This is where I hang out when I travel. <laughs> um, and this bookstore is in a little village of um, Taormina, which is hanging off a, a cliff in Sicily. My husband and his family had decided to spend the day going up Mount Etna, the local volcano. But instead, I went to the local bookstore to find um, my usual half a suitcase full of novels in Italian, most of which are not available here. Booksellers, Taormina. Just above the Cyclops restaurant, 
Up stone steps smelling of eucalyptus broods the bookstore, breathing the decay of tarnished roses pasted under the noon rain. Inside, life is made of words and the kindness of women who leave their accounts to help a foreigner seeking books in Italian. My vocabulary is così così. I need books non troppo difficile. And they understand from my accent that I love their language in my clumsy, inept way, a language graceful as the cat stretched on the lintel or the tides foamless below the village. The donne rush to the shelves, offer mystery, but I shake my head. If I miss even one clue, sono finita. We move to romance. They make piles of their favorites, hand me crisp paperbacks with covers featuring uh, shadowy figures, the sea. The airlines are strict about weight. We joke about the touristas need to buy clothes or jewels, but books are più importanti. I pay, then find my way back into the world, down cobblestone alleys swept by a warm wind. Okay, Pam. Thank you, Donna. That was that was just so wonderful. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, um, for about the past year or so, I've been working on a series of uh, mixed media visual poems where I take a stock photo and then I um, write a very short poem in response to it. And then I text box the poem into the photo. They um, they look kind of like this, if uh, people can see that. And um, all of the uh, photos are of men. So the poems all have titles like Mr. This and Mr. That. And some of them, obviously, it makes no sense to read aloud if people can't see the photo. But I think some of them do kind of stand alone if I describe the photo. So I'm going to read a few of those. Hold on one second. Um, the first one is of a guy with a, a very paranoid look on his face. He's kind of looking over his shoulder and he's surrounded by darkness. So this is Mr. Paranoia. He's staring a hole through his back. He can run, but he can't breathe the darkness. The walls of his nerves are closing in and he doesn't even trust his toothbrush. Nobody's out to get him, but his own thin sliced fear. Just because his shadow floats amiably in his wake, doesn't mean he's not stalking himself. Um, the next one is, thank you. Um, the next one is um, a picture of a uh, bodybuilder with, you know, the rippling muscles. And he's wearing a pair of jeans and um, he's uh, shirtless. And he's holding a couple of big round objects in his hands. So this is Mr. Judgment Day. God, a swirl of celestial beef, is holding two planets in his hand. He's fed up with both of them. He drums his testy fingers on his jeans. So many ways to destroy a no good world. He'll glare them full of holes like a wiffle ball, then decide which one to drop kick first. And um, thank you. Um, and this is this is the the one that I showed before. Um, it's a guy, 
it's a guy wearing a jacket and he's kind of holding it open to reveal all of this uh, body art that he's painted on his bare torso. It's Mr. Showoff. Like Norma Desperate, I'm ready for my close-up. I've glued eyes on my nipples, lodged a moonstone in my navel, and my soul is seeping through my chest. Gaze amorously at my heart-shaped torso. There's a melodrama playing inside. I'll fling myself open to astound you, peel back clothes, skin, flesh, my elaborate guts. When my innermost fibers explode in flames, whatever's left of you will applaud. And uh, you don't have to applaud after every poem, by the way. That's OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the next photo is just of uh, footprints in the sand. Mr. Missing. He strode into the ocean and we never saw him again. All that remained were his ominous footprints rising from the sand like welts. He trashed his possessions, dismantled his house, bitterly burned his money like old love letters. What unspeakable skin was he shedding? Did someone command him from the sea's sub-basement, her briny anger pulling him down the beach? All we'll ever know is this. 20 years later, those prints are still there, insistent secrets blackening in the sun. And I'll read two more. This one is what poetry is. It's an oddball. It's bioorganic. It's a prickly pear. It's a criminal conversation. It's an island of Northwest Scotland noted for its tweeds. It's April Fool's Day. It's a trampoline. It's an instrument for recording variations in tension. It's a shoot 'em up. It's fortified wine. It's a soft, malleable, and highly toxic element. It's a third eye. It's Peck's bad boy. It's an arboretum. It's a temporary suspension of breathing. It's strong, stout, sturdy, tough, stalwart, and tenacious. It's an ejection seat. It's an embassy. It isn't what you think it is. It's in spite of everything. <coughs> um, one second. And this last one is too much. Oh, no, wait a minute. Not, I'm thinking of the Mary Trump book again. It's called This Much We Know. All disasters begin inside tiny padlocked boxes. The periodic table is dissolving before our eyes. Therefore, the Taj Mahal will become a hotel for ghosts. All women secretly want to be Theodore Roosevelt's, but none would be caught dead in this centipede bikini. Therefore, who am I to dip my fingers in boiling oil? No cathedral of exhaustion has spires that point sideways. An imploding neutron star can't dance on the head of a godsend. Therefore, we must all till the feudal fields of sleep. 
all human beings compare themselves to battlefields. All fallen, all fallen warriors are reborn as shards of silence. No man is an island, but some women are. Consequently, our hearts turn so easily into ladders. <coughs> Therefore, the world politely refuses to end. Thank you all so much. Okay, and I'll take over. Just in time for um, a poem about Germany and my friend Bonnie Woods. Bonnie, would you wave please? Because this is a poem that I wrote to my good friend, um, Bonnie Woods, who is an artist who lives part-time in Berlin and part-time in Boston. And are you in Berlin now, Bonnie? I'm in Berlin, yes. Okay, and who has been kind enough to include my poetry in several, several of her photography shows in Germany and elsewhere. And this poem is, a, uh, is about a photograph Bonnie sent me of Karen perched on a stone bridge in a park in Berlin. It's great gray, and I hope I say the one German word correctly. <laughs> great gray. Noon approaches the canal in Berlin, the usual bridge of sun mottled stone trod by human feet. No, if any of them want my advice. Sorry? Sorry. Okay, let me start again. Noon approaches the canal in Berlin, the usual bridge of sun mottled stone trod by human feet. Today, Grau Reier, you have chosen to pose on the wall's edge. Homo sapiens on one side, water on the other, under the willow that has stopped her weeping to look at you. A moment ago you came, smelling of fish and wind, your black arrowed eyes and ochre-dipped beak. You are today's miracle for all who care to see. Even the bushes are breathless. Tomorrow and ever after, I will look for you, imagine folding you into my arms, smoothing your silk, listening to all your secrets at water's edge. Well, continuing the tour, I'm going to take you to the north of England, where my husband whole family lives and where he was born. And the inspiration for this poem comes from a little rock garden in the village of Didsbury. The blackbird's song there reminded me of the garden in the nursing home where my father died and of his last days there. So this poem is about both inner and outer landscapes. And there's also a mention of Thomas Mann's book, The Magic Mountain, my dad's favorite. The poem is called Blackbird. The hills have buried the day in this nondescript dawn. Stillness muffles even the language of sparrows in the hedge. The paving stones are damp with dew and the ivy shakes on the wooden fence. Blackbird, where is your song? Tiled roofs ready with echoes await your tune to open the sky. A passing cloud allows the sun to enter in its yellow dress, stroking the marmalade cat stretched on the doorstep. My father, plagued with Parkinson's that last April in the nursing home, somehow remembered Hans Castor, hero of his favorite book, spoke of him through hallucinations and trembling, of how we all live on some magic mountain weaving our lives from threads of pain into the fabric of flowers. That day in the garden, we heard a bell-throated bird song bounding through the courtyard from St. Thomas's Church. A song so sharp, it obliterated even the groan of his wheelchair inching down the graveled path. Now I hear again that curious, clear tune from the willow in the park beyond, spinning forgotten light from the plainest and darkest of birds. And I'll end today with a reading of a pandemic poem 
it was it's written about the Carnival of Venice, which unfortunately had to be canceled this year in March due to the coronavirus. <laughs> Carnival of Venice, St. Mark Square, 2020. Useless to hide one's terror behind a mask, even the kind whose black wings fly off into the periphery with opulent plumes. Carnevale has been canceled by a pandemic whose origins remain hidden in the ruffles of a taffeta costume, a jester's bells, the rhinestone sleeves of Columbina holding fresh flowers and fear. The, the sad strings of lights, the crowds of pre-Lenten partygoers are rendered superfluous in the face of a virus secretly planning pandemonium from its unknown nest under cobbled streets or airborne on the wings of a bat circling a Chinese boat in the harbor. Simply one germ that's all it takes, threads itself into the center of a sequin on a harlequin's hat. The masks of this new feast are blue side out, papery in texture, antiviral pleats <clears throat> over nose and mouth, keeping the panic in. At the local markets, supplies of bottled water and tinned fish are gone. The lamplit piazza is shrouded in fog, abandoned by all sensible people, some of whom will be dead the next time the moon rises over the basilica. But tonight they will hug their children for just a moment longer. Thank, thank you. you. Th thank you, Donna. Thank you, Pam. That was great.